Hello and welcome to Lady Dynamite Creates. This is Tiffany and today I decided that after how much work Mermaid was, I needed a relaxing project this time around. So I thought a sewing heavy Lolita doll was just what I needed. I also wanted to make this a buy nothing doll to use at some of my fabric and ribbon stash because I hoard craft supplies like it will save me during a zombie apocalypse. I chose my fabric with the help of my Patreon supporters and got to work. I looked around at a lot of different dresses to get an idea of the key elements of this style and it seemed like lots of trims and ruffles are the way to go. With that in mind, I decided to tackle the outfit first, so let's get started. For the dress, I'm using a pattern from Moonlight Jewels Sewing Miniature Clothing Volume 2, specifically the Neapolitan dress with some alterations. I take my altered center front pattern piece and layer different ribbons and lace down the front. I find using a bit of glue to tack things in place very helpful because pins were not able to keep these thin ribbons secure while I stitched them down. I wanted to take a moment and thank all of you who subscribed. I hit 20.3k subs and I'm so grateful to everyone who supports my art. Sincerely, thank you. I attach the embellished center panel to the side panels and I take care to ensure that the lace doesn't get caught in the seam. Something I find helpful when sewing such small seam allowances on a machine is to make sure the needle starts in the up position and that the top thread is not pulled down into the bobbin area. This can help prevent your machine from sucking your project in below the needle plate. For the sleeves, I gather the bottom edge to the width of my lace cuff and I layer with trim. I should have made my cuffs a bit longer because I ran into some trouble later. I gather the top edge and I attach the sleeves to the armholes. The uneven thickness of the cuff was having a bit of trouble on the machine, so I used my tweezers to help guide it through. With the sleeves now attached, I can sew up the side seams and I make sure to pin right sides facing and match up the seams carefully for the best fit. Now here is where I ran into some trouble. I didn't take into account the thickness of the trim on the sleeve cuffs and it was nearly impossible to flip right side out. But after a lot of fiddling, I finally managed it. I was really worried I was going to have to remake the whole bodice. I finished off the bodice of the dress with a bow at the neck. More ruffles. Yes, that's what we need. I take two long rectangles and hem one edge and I gather the other side. Once gathered, I can attach them to the two side skirt panels. With the large ruffle added, I play around with different trim and lace and I layer that on top too because I want this to be the frilliest doll I've ever made. I really take that to heart with the center skirt panel and I make it layer upon layer of ruffles and lace. With all the skirt panels complete, I sew them together with right sides facing. You will notice that the center front panel has had its side stitched down. I wanted to make sure that the ruffles stayed neat when I stitched the panels together, so I basted down all of the side edges of the ruffles to prevent them from bunching. To attach the skirt to the bodice, I sew two gathering threads along the top of the skirt. I always sew two when possible because it helps keep the gathering flatter. If you only do one, it can cause the seam allowance to fold down or swirl around the thread. I gather the skirt until it's the same length as the bodice. I do a bit of gathering first and then I start pinning it in place. I pin the two edges and the center point and then I adjust the gathering if less or more is needed and make sure that they are evenly spaced. When the skirt is attached, the final thing to do is add Velcro and sew up the back. Here's the complete outfit. I actually made these bloomers for a different doll but never used them and they were perfect for this custom. Now let's pick a doll and prep her. After I finally completed the outfit, I started looking at my stop box for a suitable doll. Draculaura would be okay but more pink that I wanted to use. 
I love Frankie's mold, but the green clashes too much, and Raven is a good neutral base, but not really speaking to me. While lamenting my choices, my husband says, what about a yellow doll? Those colors would look nice together. So I pull out this doll. It's a bee creator monster with a Luna Matthews head. I will need to change out the hands and get rid of the painted black on the forearms and legs. Since the body is from the Creator Monster line, they pop off easily. With 100% acetone, I remove the factory paint. Once I had all of the paint removed, I noticed some small tears in her part line, so this time around I'll be doing glued wefts instead of a reroute. I could work around it, but I would rather not deal with the headache. Next, I give the limbs a bit of sanding to remove the bulk of the color and then wipe them with acetone to remove any remaining paint. I have to be careful and work quickly because acetone will melt the plastic, but I keep a wet cloth nearby to clean off the residue. I plan to give her pink hair, so I give the scalp a coat of paint in the corresponding color. Now for the accessories. I figured since I was trying to use up existing supplies, I would use a pair of shoes from my overflowing stock box. I found these adorable apple white shoes that will be perfect with a few alterations. The heel has a small bit of apple theme detail, so I use my X-Acto blade to shave down the bits. When it's mostly even, I sand the plastic to get a smooth finish. Now, the shoes just need to be painted in colors to match your outfit. The paint I'm using is Vallejo model color and I absolutely love it. It leaves behind minimal brush strokes and is very opaque. I protect the paint with a coat of Liquitex matte varnish. I love how the shoes turned out. Ever After High and Monster High always had the best shoes. I wish they would have had more detailed paint jobs just to show off how great the sculpting really was. I figured she needed another accessory and a bag would fit the bill nicely. I designed a pattern in Illustrator and after my failed attempts at neatly cutting scalloped edges by hand, I popped it onto my M1 laser and let it have a shot. When the laser had all of the pieces cut out, I clean the surface of any piece that I will paint with acetone. This will remove any finishes and oils that can keep the paint from bonding to the surface. I give these pieces a coat of pink paint that matches the shoes and the outfit. I layer the front panel with my decorative pieces and a bit of trim and I stitch it in place. I also stitch the front flap to the back panel. Now I can start the final assembly. I sew the gusset to the front and back panels with right sides facing. The two sides of the gusset are extra long so that I can thread jump rings and secure them in place on the inside of the bag with a bit of glue. The jump rings will be attachment points for the beaded strap. One side of the strap has a clasp so that the bag can easily come on and off. I wanted to say thank you to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Angel Book Walter, B. Burnett, Deborah Sweeney, Star FML, Stephanie L, Manders, Delicious, Amber S, Art for Tori, Awkward Burb, Bex Mini Studio, Camille, Dancing Johari, Kitsy, K Whipbell, and the Oak Magpie. I finished off the bag with a few flat back pearls, a bow, and a snap closure. I think it turned out super cute, and I kind of want to make one of these in my size. Now the face up. Here are all the supplies I used, various watercolor pencils, pastels, and some mica powder. And you'll notice this time around I actually used some Jane Davenport pastels. I don't use these often because they're not very pigmented, but generally work well for light blushing. The biggest issue I tend to have with pan pastels is range of colors. Pan pastels are expensive, so of course I don't have every color offered, which means sometimes I need to mix colors myself. 
I couldn't manage to mix the color that was the perfect color, but the Jane Davenport worked well in this case. I've gotten a decent way into the first layer, but it's just not sitting well with me, and I'm hating the eye shape, and her mold is heavily sculpted, so I was struggling. I decided to just wipe it and start over. I managed to get a new eye shape down without another layer of sealant, but wiping away the previous sketch took away a lot of the tooth MSC has. I did a lot of erasing before I did the wipe. It pretty much meant layer one was the eye shape and nothing more. Luna has very bulgy eyes, so it's no wonder I found myself struggling with the eye shape just like I do with Laguna. I was very nervous about proceeding because I was going to be drastically reducing the size of her eyes, but she has an extremely defined eye sculpt. Usually when that is the case, I don't deviate that much from the mold, but I felt like it was just looking odd to keep them that big. At times, I find it hard to stomach, starting over that is, but if I continue down a path I know will leave me unsure of myself and my art, I will feel so much worse. I have to remind myself that the art isn't just about the finished product for me, but the process itself. I have to remember that being willing to admit it's not working and starting over isn't a bad thing. It's not really lost work if I hated it anyway, right? I like to think it just means I am dedicated to becoming a better artist and fixing things that I dislike. Sorry for my mini artistic self-worth rant. Let's get back to the face up. On layer two, I managed to get a lot of work done. I did lots of layering and blending of pastels, and I was in a constant battle for dominance with the eye mold. I used lots of warm browns for the eyeshadow and contouring, and when blushing, I leaned into more coral and peachy tones. I wanted to pull the teal from her dress into her face, but I also wanted to keep her makeup more neutral in tone, so that resulted in me accidentally making Fluttershy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize until the face-up was complete that I chose a yellow doll, planned pink hair, and then I gave her the same eye color as Fluttershy. Oh well, all of the characters on My Little Pony have excellent color stories, so it was bound to happen eventually. I wanted her skin to have a bit of texture to it, so I splattered the face with some brown watercolor paint, and I used a Q-tip to blot away the excess. This still felt a bit lacking, so I wound up adding some white freckles too. By layer 4, I'm much more confident in the face-up, but the irises keep feeling like they're getting muddy and lost, so I'm having to add passes of details each time. Usually when I draw on lashes, I apply dark pastel around them to soften the look for a more smoky eye, but when looking at Lolita makeup styles, the eyelashes seem to really pop against the face, so I try to mimic that here. I give the face a good dusting of mica powder in gold and pink shimmers, and of course fiddle with the eyes some more before deciding it's good and adding catch lights and highlights to the waterline. I'm really happy with how the face up turned out. I was worried the eye mold being so much larger would be super obvious, but it wound up being fine. The hairstyle I have planned is super simple with thick bangs and medium length curls. I prepare my wefts off camera and lightly sketch where her bangs will be. I find it easiest to cut and style as I go when I'm working with glued on wefts. I use hot glue to attach the weft because I am too impatient to wait for glue to dry. I lay down each row of fringe and I trim to length. I make sure my scissors are angled away from the hair I am cutting ever so slightly just to avoid an uneven jagged edge. When I start on the hair that will be curled, I lay down one row at a time, and then I curl all that hair with my flat iron and a metal chopstick before adding the next row. You could lay in all the wefts at once, then curl when you're done, but it can be a bit more cumbersome.
doll customizing always takes a little bit longer when I have to take puppy cuddle breaks, but I mean, who can deny this sweet girl? I finished laying in wefts and when I reached the top, I fold a weft over and glue it in place. Then I add another weft in the same manner to the other side to create a neat part. You can see here I started adding in a few pastel teal streaks to help break up that pink color and to pull her away from the fluttershy look. I secure her headband in place with a couple of decorative pins, and finally our Lolita girl is complete. You'll remember this is where we started, and here's where we ended up. I asked my patrons what I should call her, and they suggested Lola, which I thought fit her perfectly. If you are interested, Lola is available for purchase on my Etsy shop, and you can find that link in the description box below. I wanted to thank you all so much for watching, and remember, Always be creating.